Well, hello and welcome to uh, critical updates on the payment uh, or the Paycheck Protection Plan and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program from the SBA. This is a joint presentation from WACIF, the Washington Area Community Investment Fund, and our friends over at the Small Business Administration. My name is Lyles Battle. I'm a program manager here at WACIF and uh, really happy to have you with us uh, this afternoon. Before I introduce uh, Roderick Johnson, who will be our special presenter, I'd like to introduce Shawna Yaldell, our Chief Lending Officer. She has a few words of uh, information about uh, the services that are available from WACIF. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in. We are just delighted to um, be able to present these critical updates. Timing is everything. Uh, brief introduction to WACIF. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, Michelle. Uh, WACIF's mission, we've been around uh, the Washington DC metro area since 1987, and we provide wraparound services for entrepreneurs, all in an effort to promote equity and economic opportunities, particularly in underserved communities. And one of the ways that we do that is through our loan fund. The SBA helps us out in numerous ways, but uh, we're delighted that we are now able to offer the PPP uh, application. It's, it's live uh, on our website, if you can go to the next slide. And uh, we'll talk more about this as we get further into the presentation, but we're very, very excited that this time around, we are able to um, offer the PPP application. So after you get all this good information from our uh, subject matter expert, uh, feel free to, to reach out and, and start the application process right away. So without further ado, the reason we're all here, we want to go ahead and allow Roderick um, to go forward with your presentation. All right, thank you, Chama. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Rod Johnson. I'm the Lender Relations Small Business Development Center Project Officer at the U.S. Small Business Administration here in Washington, D.C. We cover Prince George's and Montgomery County in Maryland, all of Northern Virginia, and of course, Washington, D.C. In my first role as the Lender Relations Specialist, I look to burst open the vault doors of every bank in the DMV so that you will have money to start, grow, and sustain your businesses throughout its life cycle. In my second role, I oversee the Small Business Development Centers, where I'm assuring that you guys are getting all the technical assistance that you need, as well as getting the money that you need in hand, all right? So with that, let's go to the next slide so that we can talk about PPP, idle, the debt relief. But before we get very deep into that, I want to give you some statistics. So as you know, um, back on December 27th at 5.30, ex-President Trump signed into law the Economic Aid Act to the tune of $284 billion. All right, the program opened up on January 11th for minority borrowers, and the minority borrowers were to go to the CDFIs, like WACOF, and you know, be able to receive money first before the portals were opened up to the other banks on January 18th. Now, out of that 284 billion, we have $128 billion left as of yesterday, okay? Now, there are 5,141 lenders participating in this program. There have been 2 million loans already approved during this program. Now, let me give you a breakdown of DC, Maryland, and Virginia. So in DC, there have been 3,831 businesses that have applied for PPP to the tune of $496 million. In Maryland, we've had 26,646 businesses apply to the tune of $2.3 billion. In Virginia, we've had 30,727 businesses apply to the tune of $2.6 billion. For those businesses that are located in Washington, D.C. proper, I know we have more than 3,800 businesses that need this money. So if you are sitting on the sidelines, please 
apply. Now, who are the major lenders so far in the PPP program? Well, as you can imagine, JP Morgan comes in first. They have approved $4.4 billion. Bank of America comes in second at $4.1 billion. And then there's an organization called Itria Ventures at $3.5 billion. So those are your top lenders in terms of processing the loan request to get money out on the streets of America. Now, the average loan size is $76,000. And 83% of these PPP loans are under $100,000. All right. Now that we have that backdrop, let's get into the PPP. So there's PPP 2.0 is what we're calling the Economic Aid Act. And so how do you qualify? Businesses and nonprofits with fewer than 300 employees can borrow up to $2 million, but you must demonstrate a 25% or greater decline in gross revenues during any one quarterly period, okay? 2020 compared to the same quarter in 2019. So for example, you can take June 30, 2019 and compare it to June 30, 2020, okay? You must show a 25% or greater loss during that period. Or you can look at March 31st, 2019 to March 31st, 2020, it must show a 25% reduction. Out of 24.5, out of 24.6, I've been getting phone calls about that. We're not in math class. We're not rounding up. It's a 25% or greater loss. By the way, if you are going to submit your QuickBooks, your compiled or reviewed quality income statement, then you as the 51% or more owner must sign and date that income statement to attest to the veracity of the numbers that you are supplying to that financial institution. If you do not, they will push it back. And of course, it will delay your application. All right, so now we're talking about PPP 1.0 is still open. All right, so if you've applied for the first round of PPP, you must have spent all of the money before you can obtain PPP 2.0 or the second draw. Now, some of you have called me and said, I haven't used up all my money. There are two ways to use it up. I'm gonna tell you the first way first. And then as we go through the presentation, I'll give you the second way. So what you're going to do is provide a hazard pay bonus to your employees. And it's going to be on a non-discriminatory basis. And this is what I mean. So you're not gonna give one employee $100 and another employee $1,000. You're going to give every employee, whether that's $100 or $750 or $500, the same amount of bonus. That's how you can use up all of your cash. So now you are eligible to apply for PPP 2.0. In the statute, it does not say that you must apply for forgiveness for your PPP 1.0. Now your bank may have a preference that you do that, but it is not part of the statute. Now, later on in the presentation, um, I have page numbers of the 5,600 page statute of where you can go and look up different things, okay? For those of you who have a hard time sleeping at night, I, I have the pages for the statue where you can go look things up for yourself. All right, so first draw. This is the only time where procrastination works in your favor, okay? And that's not often. So if you procrastinated and didn't apply for PPP 1.0, the original rules apply from the CARES Act, okay? If you recall, there was PPP um, that was approved by Congress on April 2nd, 2020. Then ex-President Trump approved the PPP Flexibility Act on June 5th, okay? So with that, if you remember, you could have no more than 500 employees and you could get up to $10 million for a loan amount. Unlike the second draw, where you're limited to 2 million and you have to have 300 and fewer employees, the original rules apply if you're getting a first draw, okay? All right, next slide, please. So loan amount calculations. 
people are still having an, a hard time figuring out the calculation. It's not that hard. So if you're self-employed, this is what it means as a self-employed single member LLC, uh, excuse me, single member LLC, 1099 NEC and sole proprietorship. And the formula actually has changed, but I'll give you um, the formula for now. All right, so you will look at line 31 on your schedule C, you would divide that number by 12 and multiply it by 2.5, okay? To arrive at your loan amount, okay? And you would choose which either is higher, 2019 or 2020. Now, let me pause here for a minute. You know that the business tax returns are due on March 15th. Unfortunately, there are a lot of companies out there that still have not, okay, have not filed their 2019 tax return. And that is the 1040 with the Schedule C. All right, so now go ahead and file the 2019 and the 2020, which means that you will file the 1040 with the Schedule C by March 15th, all right? That's what you're gonna do because you wanna be able to see between those two years, which is the higher of the two calculations for that second draw, all right? So that it's important that you do that. Now, payroll costs have slightly expanded to include disability and life insurance, okay? And I have it marked here in red for you. New PP, new with PPP 2.0. So I give you a good chart here, number of employees, three, five, or six. I go through and do the calculations and show you the calculations. So it is a gross pay for US residents up to 100,000 for the year, plus the employer share of insurance, which includes health, dental, vision, disability, and life, plus the employer's share of retirement and state unemployment. So we see that our average payroll cost is, excuse me, our total payroll cost is 307,000. Our monthly average cost is 25,633, okay? Now keep that number in mind because we're gonna need to use it later on when I show you on the application where and how you use that number. Next slide, please. So for those of you that are in the restaurant and hotel, motel, Holiday Inn, if you remember that Rapper's Delight song, right, back in 1976, if your NAICS code begins with 72, and I'm realizing that a lot of people don't know where to find their NAICS code. And so that is, if you have an 1120, 1120S, or 1065 tax return, it's on the upper left-hand side of your tax return. Now, what I've done here is giving you the 72, beginning with the 72, all the different um, NAICS codes for special food services, food services, contracts, caterers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the difference in the calculation is instead of 2.5, you're gonna take 3.5 times instead of the 2.5 times. The calculation is very easy, but I've made it easy for you to find your, the NAICS code that you should use, okay? Next slide, please. And by the way, one of the things that slows down the processing of your application, particularly if you did the first PPP 1.0, is that for some reason, when people are applying for the second draw, they're using a different NAICS code. Folks, use the same NAICS code that you used if you applied for PPP 1.0. Now, a few slides back, remember when I said that I'm gonna show you two ways to use up all your money? Well, here's the second way, all right? So now you can use PPP money to cover operating expenses, such as um, enlisting a payroll service, right? ADP, Ceridian, Gusto, Paychex, all right, and some of the others. You can use the money now to buy that QuickBooks accounting software. You can now use the money to buy a CRM like Salesforce Pro, all right? That's one way. Another way is you can use the money now for the PPE right? COVID-19 testing of your employees, deep cleaning, sneeze guards, new outdoor space, new drive-through <laughs> barriers, okay? Face masks. You can now use PPP for that. 
for those located in Washington, D.C., where there was looting and vandalism or, per or public disturbances, the cost that your insurance company does not cover, you can use PPP for that. And then lastly, you can use PPP for inventory to restock your shelves. Now, listen closely, come close. All right, so at the bottom left-hand side of the, of the presentation, if you have already submitted your forgiveness form for PPP 1.0, you cannot go back, all right, and claim these expenses. It's only when you have not actually gone for forgiveness that you can go back and now claim these. So that way you can use up all of your PPP 1.0 money. So let's repeat. So there are two ways. One, a hazard pay bonus. And two, you can go back and actually grab these expenses, these four categories of expenses to use up all your PPP money, okay? All right, next slide, please. All right, I have not talked about the improvements for forgiveness. So what we found in the first round is that the $525 billion of PPP money that was put out on the street, we found that I think the number was like 83 or 86% around it there of the money was $150,000 and below. Now, if you recall, there were three 3508 forgiveness forms. We had the 3508S form where it was $50,000 and below. Then we had the 3508EZ form, which was $50,001 up to 2 million. And then what I call the long form, the 3508 long form, where you had a loan for two to $10 million. Well. The 3508S form has been revised to show the $150,000 or less. The, the forgiveness form itself is a one-page document. Pages two and three are actually the instructions on how to fill out the forgiveness form. Let me pause here. Whether it's PPP first draw, second draw, forgiveness. We'll talk about idle in a minute. Idle. Idle advance, the idle loan, okay? I want you guys to use your CDFIs, SCORE, um, the Small Business Development Centers, the Wisman, Women Business Centers, the VBOX, the Veterans Business Opportunity Centers. Use all of these resources to assist you in completing these forms, okay? Because your banks have huge volumes of forgiveness forms and frankly, draws one and two to process. You do not wanna have any mistakes on these forms when you're submitting them. So get out of the DIY and go use these resources, free resources that are available to you, okay? Now, just remember, you have to show the documentation that includes a 25% quarterly drop in your gross revenues, okay? Now, the Idle advance will not be deducted from your forgiveness amount. I'm sure there'll be questions on that later, so I'll explain it. Now you have a flexible covered period date, okay? Between eight and 24 weeks. The loan coverage period for PPP1 has been extended through March 31st, 2021. If you remember, it was December 31st, 2020. All right, here's the tax clarification. Forgiveness of the loan is not reported as taxable income at the federal level. Notice I said federal, I didn't say the state level, okay? It's not taxable on the, on the federal level. And you can deduct the expenses paid using the PP loan money on your business tax returns because before you couldn't do that, all right? Next slide, please. So, Here's the eligibility changes. So now you have 50C6 organizations, destination marketing organizations, newspapers, TV, radio, and public broadcasters are now eligible for this money. Now, bankruptcy, I get this question all the time. You cannot be filing a chapter seven and expect to get a first draw, right? Because the chapter seven means that you're liquidating. Now, if you're doing a chapter 11, just understand that that PPP loan takes precedence, or as it says here, 
supersedes any and all other claims, which means that in that chapter 11 reorganization, the PPP loan takes priority, okay? All right, let's go to the next slide. We're not gonna worry about what's on the bottom. I've talked about it. All right, so now we have targeted loans, okay? And with those targeted loans, that means that we want to see underserved communities, businesses located in underserved communities get the money. I think if my math is right real quick here, it looks like $40 billion. So let's get at it. Businesses with 10 or fewer employees located in the mid to low income area who have never received a PPP loan, 15 billion has been set aside for that. Businesses with 10 or fewer employees located in a mid and low income area, but did get a PPP and now want to get a second draw, there's been 25 billion set aside for that. So that's your total of 40 billion for money that's set aside, targeted to low and moderate income areas. Now you ask me, so how do I know? Well, you're gonna keep this website handy, sba.gov forward slash PPP. There's a URL there where you'll put in your zip code and immediately it will tell you if you're located in a low to moderate income area, okay? Now the maximum loan amount for these loans is $250,000. The SBA is going to actually do their due diligence. And so you want to know, where do I go get this money? You go get it from your CDFIs. We have enough of them in this area. Waco, um, LEDC, Industrial Bank, City First Bank, okay? This is where you go to get the money. All right, next slide, please. Now, the loan application, it's real simple. All right, remember I talked about the NAICS code. So you're gonna use the NAICS code, okay, that you used on your 2019 tax return for your second draw. Now, remember that average monthly payroll from slide four where it was 25,633? Now you just do the simple multiplication of 2.5 and your loan amount is 64,082, okay? And you can see how simple the loan application is. It really is that easy. So you don't have to rely on your lender necessarily to tell you what your loan amount is gonna be because you already know how to do it. Now, I would have these slides available as I'm filling out the forms and figuring out what the um, calculation is. Um, something just came to my remembrance. For There is the Biden-Harris program that started on February 24th for minority companies located in minority areas with 10 or fewer employees, okay? And it's geared toward single member LLCs, sole proprietorships, and 1099 and EC. So instead of using line 31, they're now going to be using line seven on the schedule C, which is gross income. Now, this is a Rod Johnson editorial because it's not fact yet. It's not an IFR. What I suspect is it's gonna be gross income divided by 12 times 2.5. But again, we haven't received you know, the guidance on that yet, but we need to hurry up and receive it because I think the program is over on March 9th. Okay, but I just wanted to throw that in there for you. March 31st, Rod. Pardon me, no, 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 but it's no. March 30th. No, not for the targeted. Oh, you're talking about the targeted. I'm talking, okay. to, I'm talking about the targeted, the Biden-Harris program that started February 24th. The regular, the regular PPP program ends on March 31st. That is correct. But for the, what I call the Biden-Harris targeted program, I think it's March 9th. All right. So you see all these URLs for, you know, the forms, the 2483, for the second draw and the first draw form. Forget all that. You're not going to remember it. Just remember sba.gov forward slash PPP. You can get your first draw, second draw, the legislation, the forgiveness forms, the IFRs, the frequently asked questions. All of that is at sba.gov forward slash PPP. That one's easy to remember. Next slide, please. All right, so idle. Now, if you recall, 
the EIDL loan was actually the first program put out by the SBA the third week in March 2020. And if you recall, it went up to $2 million until we actually received 4 million applications for this program. And so they cut it down from 2 million to 500,000. So now the maximum loan amount is 150,000. If you have an idle loan and you want an increase, don't call me, don't call the SBA district office. You email pdcrecons at sba.gov in the subject line, you put increase along with your current idle number and send it to them. And if it takes five weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, don't call me, okay? You're gonna call the 800 number that's at the end of the presentation. And I think it's disaster customer service at sba.gov. And that's where you're going to get your updates. Don't call me because I do not have access to the Office of Disaster Assistance systems. All right, loan amounts above $25,000 will require a blanket lien on your business assets. The loan payments are deferred for 12 months, but remember interest is accruing. There's no penalties for prepayment of the loan. Unlike PPP, you don't have the 60-40 split. So you can use some of the money for payroll and then for those operating expenses that we've talked about before. Remember, the idle loan is just that. It is a loan. There's nothing forgivable about it. It is a loan. It's a 30-year loan at 3.75% or 2.75% if you're a nonprofit, okay? <sighs> if you've already applied for EIDL, the grant is not available. It is available on an emergency basis for targeted business. So what does that mean? Go to the next slide, please. All right, so it's targeted to low-income areas. Here the theme, if your business is located in a low to moderate income area. So to qualify, you have to show a 30% drop. Unlike PPP, it's 25 for idle, it's 30 between March 2nd, 2020 to December 31st, 2021 when the program expires. There is a $10,000 grant maximum and it's forgivable, but you don't have to do anything for it to be forgiven, okay? It's a grant, it's a $10,000 grant. The second qualification is you have to be located in a low to moderate income area where 20% or more of the population lives in a poverty or median family income that is 80% or less the statewide median um, family income. Now, you see the URL at the bottom, sba.gov slash PPP, and you'll find the URL, okay? And just drop in your zip code. Next slide, please. Now, there is an emergency. The other one was targeted. This one is an emergency. It's funded to the tune of 20 billion, all right? So there are two things. If you received an IDA loan, but you never received the grant, you're eligible, okay? This is if you're not in the low-income community. You qualify, again, where you never applied for either the loan or the grant. Don't understand why you didn't apply for either, but you didn't you're eligible. SBA is gonna verify all the information. It's gonna take 21 days, so don't call me or Antonio Doss, because we're not gonna know. Just understand it's gonna take 21 days easily for the payments to get into your account, okay? Now, don't call the SBA. They will call you or email you and tell you whether or not you're eligible, okay? All right, next slide, please. Now, the debt relief. So, if you already have an existing SBA loan, 7A microloan of 504, on your behalf, the SBA will actually pay three months of principal and interest on your behalf. For new 7A 504 for microloans, it says six months and now it has to be changed. It's now down to three months of principal and interest payments on the new loans, okay? The money is running out so fast on these new loans 
that now their SBA has had to scale it back to three months and not six months of principal and interest payments on the new loans. Now, here's what's exciting if you get a new microloan 7A or 504. The borrower has no payments. It's, it's no SBA fees for you as the borrower. For the lender, the SBA is not paying the annual fee to the SBA. Now, to induce the lenders or entice them to make loans to you guys for the signature 7A program that goes up to $5 million, the bank now gets a 90% guarantee instead of a 75% guarantee. For the SBA Express, they get a 75% guarantee instead of a 50% guarantee, okay? And again, there are no fees. So run out to your nearest lender and get that new loan to grow your business, okay? The SBA Express now has risen from 350,000 up to $1 million. So go get the money, it's there. All right, next slide, please. Uh, we can go next slide, I already covered that. All right, the SVOG, there's still guidance coming out about this. But as you know, the Kennedy Center, the African American Museum, the 930 Club, Blues Alley, you know, Ramsey in Annapolis, the Aquarium in, in, in Baltimore, you know, live event operators, movie theaters, concert halls, jazz club, Broadway venues, comedy clubs, museums, all that charge ticket admissions for an event are eligible. You have to be operational by February 29, 2020 with less than 500 full-time employees and experience a 25% reduction in revenues in at least one quarter. Well, since these places have been closed, we know that they've seen a 25% reduction. So that's not going to be an issue. The grant amount is 45, yeah, 45% of 2019 annual revenues. If it existed before 2019 or six months of average revenues in 2019, if it existed after January 1st, 2019. The, you cannot have received P, a PPP loan after December 26, 2020. Now, the grant money has to be used the same way as the PPP program, 60% employees, 40% expenses, and can also include marketing, ad, staging, and other event expenses, okay? Now, there will be a supplemental grant available to extend through June 30, 2022 at 50% of the original grant amount, okay? Now, SVOG grant at sba.gov, you can pull down all the information you need, the application, the frequently asked questions, all of that is at that URL, all right? Next slide, please. All right, so remember I told you, for those of you that can't go to sleep at night, that the act well, it's a 5,600 page document. Well, I've taken the time to give you the page number. So if you wanna know about changes to the 7A loan program, it's on page 2,164 of the legislation. If you wanna know about the PPP loan coverage period, then it's on page 2,055. So for those of you that you know have a hard time going to sleep, I've given you the page numbers where you can find different topics within the 5,600 page legislation. All right, next slide, please. All right, so here we go. The SBA Disaster Customer Service Center, you have the 800 number. And again, it's disaster service, customer service at sba.gov. Do not call me or anyone in my office asking what the status is of your idol, or for that matter, your PPP. Any questions for the PPP, where it's being processed at your bank, you go to your bank for that. Just remember the district office is a policy distributor to the banks and to our resource partners. We have nothing to do with the lending process, okay? We don't approve loans. We don't recommend approvals, none of that. We're a policy office, okay? All right, next slide, please. So scams, all right? If they're not coming from sba.gov or treasury.gov and you see sba.com, treasury.com, you know it's a scam. That's the long and short of the slide. 
All right, next slide, please. And you can probably, yeah, I was gonna say that's it. So we can open it up for questions. So I know we have questions, probably plenty of questions. Okay, so can you hear me? We can hear you. All righty. The first question is, is it true we have to give back any EIDL grant if we get PPP? If so, we still need to report the grant as income on our 2020 taxes? So no, you do not have to give back the EIDL grant. It is a grant, okay? And yes, you're going to report it on your, yes, you're going to report it on your 2020 taxes, but it's going to fall under, I think that's line six, if I remember, on the Schedule C. I don't have it in front of me, but I think it's going to be reported on line six of the Schedule C. Now, if you are doing compiled, reviewed, or audited financial statements, it should show it as extraordinary income on the income statement, okay? And the same goes for the PPP. So let's go over the entries, the journal entries for, for my budding CPAs. So for PPP, right? We know that it's a short-term debt on the liability section of your balance sheet, okay? So it is a current liability. It's not a learned long-term liability because typically you're not going to carry that on your books for 12, over 12 months, okay? So it's a short-term liability. Then when it's forgiven, it's not taken into ordinary income because it's not the income that you derive from the ordinary course of your business. It's going to show under your operating profit line where it says extraordinary gain, or you can even change it to say extraordinary revenue. That's where the forgiveness will actually show. Remember, it's a non-taxable event at the federal level, but each state is different, okay? So you're gonna have to check with your CPA on that. Okay, the next question is, I received the first round of PPP loans and I've completed my 2020 taxes. I processed my first application through my payment processor, Square, but there has been a delay in my second application and I want to apply for a second round before they expand outside of small business. How should I move forward? Wait a minute. So did you really apply or not for the second round? They have, it seems like they have not because there's been a delay in their second application, but they want to apply for the second one. So why is it? Well, it's not making sense to me. So what's the delay? So it's a delay that if they've applied and the application is delayed, okay, then there's probably a hold that the SBA has placed on the application, which is the delay. So where is actually the delay? Because you because if they file their 2020 tax returns, which by the way, Array for you, okay? I'm glad to hear that. Really glad to hear that. So that's great. The next question so, is... But come back to that, because I really want to answer that question so okay. that we know where the real delay is. It All right, says, so go ahead to the next one. Go ahead. Are P&Ls from our accountant acceptable documents to prove a loss of income? Yes. So compiled, reviewed, or audited. So if you get audited financial statements, then you don't have to, the owner does not have to sign and date the income statement or P&L at all. If it's compiled or reviewed income statements, then yes, you have to still sign them. And yes, they're acceptable. Of course they are. In fact, I put better, more credence, frankly, and the reviewed and probably the um, compiled. And I do QuickBooks. So yes, they're acceptable, absolutely. The next question is, my company received an 
EIDL loan back in June, but I have requested an extension because in 2020, I had no income, but I do have expenses and no one has answered me yet. What else can I do? All right, so June 2020, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so remember that, all right, so this is March, April, May, June. So you got three months before you have to start making payments on that, right? Because it's 12 months deferral. But I get it. You're trying to get ahead of the curve because you're saying that you really don't have revenue to, and I guess as you flow through, you've racked up expenses. So I'm assuming your company has had a loss. And so if it's had a loss, then it certainly can't service the debt. I guess that's really what the, what it's all about. So yes, you've done the right thing. So go to disaster customer service, right? At sba.gov. And you also have the 800 number. And all I can tell you is you just gotta keep being persistent until you actually get someone on the phone to tell you what to do. Now, you can, what you're going to ask for is a modification to the existing note, okay? That's what you're gonna ask for. And in fact, I would probably, after you talk to them, in fact, actually what I would do is just go ahead and um, send the email to disaster customer service at sba.gov, put in the heading um, modification to the existing note with your current EIDL number, okay? And tell them that you want, you know what, you can ask for 12 months, right? Say you want to modify the note for 12 months to allow you time to start generating revenue so that you can pay back the loan, okay? That's exactly what I would do but you're asking for a modification. Okay, the next question is, what if you did not get the correct amount of PPP on the first round because it was based on income when you had little business? So when we received the loan, it only covered two weeks. Earning more now, but not a true indicator of our need. All right, so I'm gonna assume that you're a Schedule C, a C company. So, all right, so now you have more income in 2020, okay, I should say more net profit in 2020. So if that's the case, you're gonna use the Schedule C and you can go back and actually do it in round second draw, do it in your second draw, okay, which, which will allow you to get more money. Okay, and we do have a hand raise, so I'm gonna let Jose Alberto speak. You can proceed with your question, Jose. He's on mute. Oh, I see, yeah, he's on mute, yeah. Can we <laughs> unmute him? Nope, he has to unmute himself. Yeah. All right, there he is. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Ronald. That's, uh, I was the, the person who asked the question about, you know, because I, I I supposed to have five events uh, during 2020. And the first one was in Puerto Rico, the 29th of March. So the pandemic start, you know, 15 days before. So I have to cancel the five events and, you know, uh, these events that, uh, you know, that bring people for a competition of paella, you know, um, and so, you know, uh, 2020 has been a disaster. So. Uh, I got a, a, a loan back in June of, uh, for, you know, uh, EIDL, but I asked for an extension and, and because, you know, uh, I, I had to pay expenses for organization and all these things. But uh, so, you know, I, I, I hear your, your recommendation of, of asking to, to modify that, uh, the, the yep. loan, right? Um, yep. And also to see if I can ask for more money. You know, that, that's, that's my other question. No. No? As a prudent lender, we're not going to give you more money when you can't pay the existing loan. No, I mean, I can't pay the existing loan, but again, I need more. That, that's why, you know. And I, I just answered it. I just answered it. As okay. a prudent lender, we are not, and I repeat, not going to give you more money when you can't pay repay the existing loan. Okay. All right. 
So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Okay. Yep. And Selena Spencer also has her hand raised, so I'll let her speak. Hi. Um, I was just um, replying back. I am the business who we earned more money in 2020 than we did in 2019. And so when you had said to do the second round, I just wanted to get clear. Although we have earned more money, we've had more expenses due to the fact that we have more um, projects but we're spending more money and we're um, giving more hours in payroll. So I'm just trying to see how we could even do a second round. Thank you. Did you apply for the first round? Yes. All and right. because what happened when we applied for the second round, we got such a small amount because they were basing it off of our 2019 income that didn't even cover, it covered payroll maybe for two weeks, if that. Did you have 2020? In what, what do you file? Do you file a Schedule C or are you an 1120, 1120S? What do you, how are you structured? We, okay, so this year we will do a Schedule C um, because we've had more income, but before we would do it um, kind of um, like an individual with a business. So wait a minute. So did you actually have employees or were they 1099 contractors? We have employees. All right. So, so, all right. So you have employees. They were W-2 employees. Yes. Okay. So. And so, yes, we did a Schedule C, but let me just say, when he did, when we did the taxes, the owner did his taxes with his business. This time we will not do that. He'll just do his own taxes and then just do the Schedule C because it's, got kind of confusing. This is literally, we went from, um, because of the pandemic, what we do is pandemic related. We went from, you know, one client to lots of clients all of a sudden. So our business has grown, but our expenses have, have grown. Doesn't matter. If you haven't can't show a 25% reduction in your revenue, you can't apply. Okay. Well, I'm just going to give thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm clear. Thank you. Yeah. And okay, we have another question from Christine Brooks. And the question is, are nonprofits eligible for PPE, PPP? PPP. Because I keep because I keep hearing Schedule C nonprofits do not file Schedule C with the 990 from the IRS. I was gonna say, who's talking about a Schedule C for a nonprofit? Okay. So it's the form, it's the form 990, okay? And if they have employees, all they have to do is look at my slides to figure out what they're gonna get, right? Because I've given you the calculation for the average payroll. So yes, nonprofits are eligible. Next question is- Go ahead. Will EIDL loans be deferred or paid for three months as well? No, this is strictly for the 504, 7A, or what am I forgetting? Microloans. Yes. Not idle. Okay. The next question is from Juanita Wood, and it is for early childhood facilities who received grants during 2020. Does does this, is this money counted as gross revenue to calculate the 25% loss of PPP? Grants are how you guys get funded, right? So that's your business model. So yes, you've had to have a 25% drop in your revenues between 2019 and 2020. Just pick a quarter. But yeah, you have to show a 25% drop. Well, Rod, let me add a little uh, context because we were responsible for disseminating grants for DC child care center. Mm -hmm. And so that it's, it's, it's not a normal course of revenue, so to speak. It's kind of extraordinary. So is that still true? See, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that extraordinary because they're typically funded through grants. No, these were emergency grants due to COVID. This is outside of their- uh, Oh, it, it is definitely outside. Okay, yes. I got you. 
I got you. All right. So no, that's not included in that calculation at all. You're right. Yes, it is extraordinary income. It is extraordinary income. So no, you don't have to count that. It's just the income from your um, normal course of business. I think it'll be easy for you to show a 25% drop easily. Okay. The grant that you guys gave them is just, you know, really helping them to sustain themselves. But no, I got you. Yes, I'm with you. Yes, yes, it is extraordinary income. And it's not counted. You don't have to worry about that. Let's do the normal course. Okay, this question is from Glenn George, and it's Will sole proprietors receive an increase using line seven if already applied using line 31? Or will we need to apply for the difference? Right, so hopefully, according to the Biden-Harris plan, you're 10 or fewer employees. The goal was because they recognized that in line 31, because you know you guys are throwing a lot of expenses in there to reduce your tax liability. Then, and so in some cases, that line 31 number was negative. So you couldn't, you know, you couldn't get any money or it was small. So you received very little money. So with line seven and in gross income, the, the hope is that's not going to be a negative number. Okay. And so that will allow you to get more money under the Biden Harris program. Once they actually release what the guidance should be. Now, remember I said, it's just a practical guess that it's going to be line seven divided by 12 times 2.5. That seems to make sense to me that that's going to be the formula they use. But no, you're not going to get the difference between line seven and line 31. The next question is, I recently received my first PPP from First Draw and wondering if I can apply for the second PPP. All right. So if you've used up all the money, and if you haven't, I gave you two ways during the presentation to use up all the money so then you can apply for the second round of PPP. But the rules state that you have to use up all the money in PPP1 before you apply for the second draw for PPP2. Okay, the next question is, if we received a EIDL previously, can we apply again or be reconsidered for a larger amount? So in the presentation, I gave you the email address that states, I think it's called PDC, yeah, PDC recons at sba.gov. In the subject line, you're going to put increase along with your current idle number and then send it to them and send them any updated financial information that you have. So even if you have a QuickBooks December 31st, 2020 year in um, balance sheet and income statement, send them that, okay? So that they can see where you are. Okay, the next question is from Jerry. My first PPP is forgiven, and I think the Good. EIDL is, for, is forgivable too. But the lender said I need to repay my EIDL in advance. I received 6000 They said that they are still working with SBA to work out the terms. Is this the case? All right, so let me, okay, good. I would hope somebody was going to ask that question. So let me give you two scenarios, and we're going to use $100,000 to keep the math easy. So, and let's say in April, you applied for the idle advance first and it was $10,000. Then you went to Wakeoff and you got $100,000 PPP. Well, Wakeoff really didn't know that you'd already gotten a $10,000 idle. All right, so now you have 100,000. Now it's time to go for forgiveness. Okay, so you apply to your bank for the forgiveness. They send it to the SBA. The SBA says, aha, there's an, there is an idle advance for $10,000. So what they'll do is they'll forgive 90 of the 100. And so the borrower, 
was left with, quote, a $10,000 loan. Okay. Now, what the Economic AIDS Act has done is the SBA now has the power to issue a credit to the bank on your behalf for that $10,000 loan so you actually don't owe it to the bank. Okay. Now, let me give the other scenario. If you applied for the idle first, and then the PPP second, yeah, all right, then the bank deducted that $10,000 from the idle. So now instead of $100,000, you have a $90,000 PPP. You submit it to the bank for forgiveness, the bank submits it to the SBA, and the $90,000 is forgiven, okay? So those are your two different scenarios. But the first scenario I gave you that left you that $10,000 quote loan on the books for the bank, the SBA will be crediting the bank, which will credit you, which doesn't leave you with a loan. Again, the Economic Aid Act actually took care of that. Okay, and CJ has their hand raised, so I'm gonna give them permission to speak. Hello, Hello, how are you? Good, thank you. I have a question. So um, I started my child care business the last week of December, 2019. So I only had like one week worth of income. Um, I had one employee that joined me in January of 2020. We okay. closed in March of 2022 were closed until we reopened in September. So the 25%, um, and this this would, I, I wouldn't have to worry about the 25% um, loss of income right now because I haven't even applied for the PPP first draw yet. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. For, for the first draw, you're actually under the first rule under the CARES Act. Got it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I'm clear with that now. So I only, again, I only had one employee. So that would be probably a very low amount for the loan. I am in a uh, undeserved area. Um, would I need to do for the first draw a different application to show that I'm in an undeserved area to do the first um, first PPP loan or how, how would that work? How well, would they know that? You don't have to worry about that for PPP. Okay. That only comes into play for idle. Okay? Oh, okay, okay. For idle. And oh, okay. by the way, you are going to apply for idle because I'm assuming you haven't applied for idle. I have not applied for idle either. Um, one of the things that kind of turned me off from applying for the PPP um, initially was um, I was asked for my own personal social security number at one of the um, establishments when I was working with SBA. They kept telling me, no, the DC SBA office, um, if you have an um, a EIN, they shouldn't be pulling your credit um, uh, which is fine anyway, but still, you sh they shouldn't be pulling any of your personal information to qualify you for the PPP. That's not one of the qualifications, but um, I didn't move forward with the application because they were adamant about it. So I said, I, I didn't, you know, um, apply for it. So it sounds like they have things a little more together now, and um, I should apply for both. Yes. So there was a bank in, in the city, which I won't name, that were asking for people's social security number and pulling personal credit. When I found out, I actually wound up calling the chief lending officer and another person that I knew at that particular bank. Um, and then I told them to run it up the flagpole to the CEO of that bank to cut it out, right? Okay. Because they weren't in compliance with the PPP program, which okay. requires no collateral, no personal guarantees, okay? Okay. So the credit report should not have been pulled. So you did the right thing. 
you didn't do business with them. Right. right? Okay. Um, but that got taken care of and they stopped. Okay. Very good. All right. So yes. Um, if it's the institution I'm thinking about, you can now go because it's been corrected and, <laughs> and um, you can go now and apply. Very good. Thank you so much. And you can also apply through Wakeup. I will. Um, I'm, I'm getting ready to become a, uh, a Wakeup client. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Excellent. Couldn't go without saying that. Oh, now did I give, did I say that under the Biden-Harris plan of this, their debt relief package, that another 15 billion would be put into the idle program if it passes. Did I talk about that? All no. right, so under the um, relief program, right? They're looking to add another $15 billion to idle so that more people can get that $10,000 grant, okay? That's in the plan. And secondly, they're looking to add another $7 billion into the PPP program. So what that would suggest to me is that if they do that, then they're going to have to extend the date for the expiration of the PPP program, right? Because there's no way that, you know, we're gonna absorb $7 billion in, in what, three weeks? So I'm, I'm and this is an editorial, um, that I think that, there's going to be an extension to the deadline. It would just make sense that if this bill passes that they would do that. Okay. So I wanted to bring that up. And I do hope that the plan does get, get approved. That's important. But what I want the DC businesses to understand, please, because I'm doing a lot of these Zooms and what I am seeing and hearing is that a lot of DC businesses are still sitting on the sidelines and they're not applying. So let me go through my spiel. So we have PPP1 still that you guys haven't applied for. So we're gonna use PPP1, then we're gonna get PPP2, the second draw, okay? A lot of you didn't get idle, loan. So we're gonna get the idle loan, okay? So we're gonna get that. Now, if you happen to be in a low to moderate income area, then you're gonna get the idle advance, okay? But the SBA is gonna contact you. We have everybody's information in the database. So the SBA will contact you for the idle advance, okay? So two PPPs, the idle loan, the idle advance, okay? Then if you already have a microloan 7A or 504, then you're gonna get some help with your cash flow because for three months, the SBA is gonna make payments on your behalf, okay? And then if you are growing during this pandemic, then you can take advantage of, basically it is free, the free 504, 7A or microloan to grow your business. It's not costing you anything to do that. Then, you know, DC has grant programs and loan programs. So I know that you guys are gonna take advantage of that. So I just see so many ways that you guys can sustain your businesses if you just apply for the funds. Now, for those of you that have not, you know, filed your 2019 tax returns, let's get that done, okay? Please, let's get that done along with the 2020 because you know the 2020 information is going to be asked for. And in the PPP case, you know, you have the opportunity to look at your 2020 versus your 2019 information to determine which number is higher in terms of your payroll. So if 2019 is higher than your 2020 payroll, then we'll use the 2019 numbers to give you a larger loan amount. If your 2020 is higher than 2019, then you get to use your 2020 for a higher loan amount. So let's make sure that we get this financial information filed, okay, to assist you with what you're doing, okay? For those that are using the 941s, um, correct me, Shauna, they should have actually, that should have been filed December 31st, if I recall, right? 
So December 31st, that should be, that should have already been filed. So we can use that 941 that was filed in December. So I hope we filed them on time, right? So this should be able to be used, right? So that you can get the money that you need under the PPP program, all right? So let's make sure that we're filing our paperwork on time so that we can take advantage of these programs. Um, hopefully when I come back, um, I'll say the begin of, beginning of April, then I wanna see more than 3,800 businesses that have applied for PPP. I know we have more than 38 businesses in DC, okay? And I'd like to see this number up to like a billion dollars, not just 496 million. There's money, let's go get it. It's there for us. And you know, not to be political, but I have to give the Biden-Harris administration credit for really trying to target this money for minorities. And particularly if you're located in a low to moderate income area, all right? They're really trying to ensure that we get the money. So we need to do our part and make sure that our paperwork is filed, okay, or has been submitted so that we can take advantage of these programs. All right, so I guess I'll turn it back over to Waco for that. Well, let me, uh, if I could just make, um, just provide you, Rob, with some of our stats because you were so generous to provide, you know, overall for our region. But we actually have 67 PPP loans in our pipeline. Um, there are 13 waiting to be funded, but there are seven that have been funded. So I would love as a result of your detailed information that to explode, uh, that website to just explode. But right now we've funded about $100,000 in PPP okay. loans and the average size is around 25,000. So just to give you those, those specs okay. and, and um, those stats rather, and hopefully, you know, we can do all that we can to share this information and continue to have people apply because you're right. It would be a shame for us not to take advantage of those dollars because they've been carved out, they've been set aside, so to speak. And it would really be a shame for those not to be utilized, so. That's right. Thanks again, Rod, for that excellent presentation. Um, a lot of information uh, was able to be transmitted. And uh, thanks again also for answering uh, the uh, attendees' questions. Hopefully uh, a lot of uh, confusion <laughs> was resolved and folks can move ahead and uh, apply for both the PPP and the EIDL. Uh, again, thanks again, Rod. Oh, we just yeah. wanted to, before we leave, have some closing remarks by our Chief Program Officer, Kimberly Gale. Kimberly? Hey, Rod is the MVP. Oh my goodness. I really enjoyed the presentation and the wealth of information that you provided. Um, I know that this is a hard time for businesses and we just want you to know that we, as Wake Up being your trusted advisor can assist you through that process. But Rod, thank you again for giving us the information. For those of you who have asked a series of questions those who have attended, we will provide you with the slide deck so you can get some additional information from there. And just um, and then also, if you want to become a wake up client, you know, I have put that information in the chat button to get advisory services as well. So uh, we are here for you. We know that, um, you know, this is a trying time and we're going to get through this together. And so just want to let you all know that. And thank you for coming. Thanks, Lyles. Thanks, Shauna. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, Michelle, for managing the, the Q&A. And um, have a great day for the rest of your afternoon. Yes, thank you, guys. Thank you. See, see we'll, you invite, we'll invite you back so that we can show that increase in, in, in numbers. Yes, please hey. do. I, okay. Like I said, they say go get that money. I hey, we're, yes. we we got it. We got to do better. It's there for us to get us back on track. Let's take advantage of it. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. All right, guys. Okay. All Bye, right. everybody. Bye, bye now.